All right, we're going to be in Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter number 4 will be in verses 21 through 34. We're going to see some parables that Jesus gives last week. We talked about the parable of the soil. When we talked about the four different types of soil, there was the soil where the seed fell by the wayside, the hard soil, the soil that the seed could not go into because the, the ground was too hard. And, and remember, the seed is the Word of God, and, and the, the soil is our hearts, and what the Word of God is going to do inside of us, and, and how we react to the seed, the, the Bible being planted where we are. And so we, we saw the, the, the soil that was sown in, we, we saw the soil by the wayside, and we saw the rocky soil, the soil where the seed could get down a little bit, but it could never get rooted. And so when the sun came out, uh, what happened is that the, it, the plant withered away because it wasn't deep enough. It wasn't rooted enough, and it, it, was, it died. And then we think about the seed that fell on the thorny ground. It, it, it grew up a little bit, but then it was strangled out. It was choked out by the thorns. And... And how in our life, when we allow things to get inside of our life and we, we lose focus on the Word of God and we allow the things of the world to choke out the Word of God, the Word of God inside of us dies. And so, and then we talk about the, the, the seed that fell on good ground, the ground that was prepared for the seed. And, and we talked about how our life needs to be prepared to hear from God. And, and we should pray that God would open up our eyes that we may behold the wondrous things of the law. Right? And so we, we should pray that God would open our minds and our hearts to hear from Him. And so this week, we're going to transition to another parable. And there are a couple more parables about uh, seeds being sown and, and plants growing up. But the first one is about light. And it's about light and about how we should use our light for good. Let's read in verse number 21. It says, And He said unto them, Remember Jesus, when He came to these parables, He asked a lot of questions. And a lot of the questions weren't questions to be answered, right? They were rhetorical questions. He would ask them questions that they knew the answer to, and the question was so silly that it shouldn't have even have been, had to have been asked. And so Jesus said, so, uh, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel, or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears, let him hear. And he said to them, Take heed what ye hear, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. And he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and that the full corn, uh, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth it in the sickle, because of the harvest is come. Verse number 30 says, And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, it is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all herb, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables he spake, uh, spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. God, help us this morning as we study this passage of Scripture. God, just bring uh, what you would have us to get out of it to our minds and to our hearts. God, just pray for uh, Miss Jamie as she teaches. And just here pray. Amen. All right, when we think about the parables that Jesus is giving here, he starts out and, and he asks them a simple, if we were to take all the words that he spoke and sum them up in three words, it's where's your light? 
Where's your light? Oh, in those days, when we think about the parables, it's important that we put ourselves in the feet of those and in the shoes of those people who are receiving the parable. Right? Because if we were to talk about a candlestick in the 21st century, none of us use candlesticks to light our house anymore, right? We use them in an emergency maybe, like the power goes out or the electric is cut off or whatever that looks like. But none of us go into our house every night when it gets dark and light a candle so that we can see. But these people, the first century people that Jesus is talking to, when they lit a candle, they had to place it in a strategic area of the house so that they could see what's going on around them. Right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't for decoration. Their candles didn't smell good, right? It, it wasn't to make your house smell good. No, it was to bring light to darkness. And so Jesus here brings up this, this parable to them, this earthly, this heavenly, the, the meaning is heavenly, but the story is earthly. And he says, what are you doing with your light? When you go into your house at night and it's dark, are you hiding your light under a bushel? The answer is simple, of course not. That, and that's not at all what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm not hiding my candle because if I hide my candle, I cannot see. And so, as, as you can imagine, as Jesus is telling the story, a light bulb is going off inside these people's heads. And, and, and they know that Jesus is not talking about the candle inside their house, right? They know that this story has a bigger meaning. And then he says, uh, if you're not going to hide it under a bushel, are you going to hide it under your bed? Again, the answer is simple. It's no, no. I, I'm not going to use the candle under a bushel because then I won't be able to see the light will go out. I'm not going to put it under my bed because I don't need to see under my bed. I need to see what's going on around me, right? And so uh, the, the, the answer to, to that question was a simple no. And then Jesus says, a candle is brought to be put on a candlestick. Right? It says in verse number 21, and not to be set on a candlestick. Is a candle not to be set on a candlestick? What does that mean? That means the candlestick is the church. The candlestick is the church. If you remember in Revelation chapter number 2 and chapter number 3, it talks about the candlestick, doesn't it? And, and the candlestick holds the light. What is the light? The light is Jesus. The light is the message of the gospel. So, so Jesus here is asking, he says, oh, I've given you the gospel, I've given you the message. What are you doing with the message? What are you doing with it? Are you taking it home and are you putting it under a bushel? Are you taking it home and hiding it under the bed? No, that's not why I gave it to you. I gave it to you so that you could tell others about it. What does light do? Light dissipates darkness. Light, it, it destroys darkness. If we were to turn out every light in this building, cover up the windows with black paper, and, and make sure that the foyer, all the windows were covered as well, and if we were to light one candle, we could pretty much light up a whole room. If we put it strategically, couldn't we? We think about the world that we live in. The world we live in is a dark world. It's full of darkness. Jesus came to dissipate the darkness. He came to shed light. He said, I am the light of the world. And in John chapter number 1, it says that Jesus was the life of men, and that life was the light of men. And Jesus is the life, and the life was the light. And so by Jesus being the light of the world, He's made us the light of the world. We are not the light, but we are bearers of the light. Right? And none of us are the light, and so it's never been about us. It's all about Jesus. The point of the light is found in verse number 22. Look at verse 22. It says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but it should be, it should come abroad. The point of the light is to expose darkness. The point of the light was to shed light on the things that were going on in the world that were not right. It was to shed light on the Pharisees and let them know, hey, these rules that you're making have no bearing on someone's salvation. Amen? The, 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 these rules that you're making, all these crazy things that you made up, it, that's not what it's about. And again, he was reminding them that it wasn't about the, even the miracles that he had done. They had gotten so caught up in the miracles that they noised the, the, the miracles abroad, but they missed the message. 
If we read back, we see over and over and over that Jesus would tell someone not to tell people what, what he had done, and then would go and tell people what he had done. Why was Jesus telling them that? Because the miracles were never as important as the message. But the problem is the light that they were sharing was the miracles and not the message. What are we sharing today? What, what, what light are we sharing? Are we sharing the right light? Are we sharing uh, a different light? Because the, the light that matters, the light that we need to be sharing, is the light that dissipates darkness, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be sharing the gospel. People were dimming the real purpose of the light. Instead, they were shining the light of the miracles. While the miracles were important, nothing was more important than the message. And guess what today, friends? There is still nothing more important than the message of Jesus Christ. No, no light that we shed outside of that message is the right light. The light that we need to be sharing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we think about this. When we think about testimonies of Christians, it does two things for people. Number one, it, it encourages other like-minded believers, doesn't it? When you hear a testimony of a Christian that, that maybe... Uh, they, they had a, a really hard time, then they found Jesus, and, and now they're living a life for Jesus as a Christian. It encourages us, doesn't it? But as a non-believer, what does it do? It convicts us. It, it convicts us that we know what we need to be doing, but we're not doing it. So when Jesus says in verse number 22, For there is nothing dead which shall not be manifest or remain known, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. And he's saying that, hey, there's going to be some people who are encouraged by your testimony, and there's going to be some people who are mad and, and hurt from your testimony. But it's not you, it's the message they're mad at. Right? That no one ever has really hated their Christian. No, they've hated the message that they teach. And Jesus says, just, just remember that I have been hated also. I was hated long before you were hated. And so we must let the light shine no matter what we're going through. Amen. What does this mean for us? The church is the candlestick. And we should be holding up the light, which is Jesus. As a church, what are we doing to let our light shine uh, as we hold up the light of Jesus Christ? So what are we doing to shine light in our community? We could always be doing more, couldn't we? Uh, I think if you went around to every church in America... Of, of like-minded faith. So if you went to every independent Baptist church that was like-minded with us, and you asked them if you could be doing more for your community, the answer would always be yes. Don't you think? So what can we do as a church that can hold up the light of Jesus Christ in our community so that when people see us, they don't see uh, uh, Washington Street Baptist Church. No, they see Jesus high and lifted up. I like what someone said, and I've already said this, but we are the light. We are not the light. Jesus is the source of the light. We are just the light bulb. Right? We, we're plugged into the source. Now the light shines through us. You know, as a kid, I grew up singing the song. I'm sure a lot of us in here did. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We'd sing that for days. Right? Let me get to that second verse. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. And, and that just as the children's song was relevant back then, it's still relevant today. Are we hiding our candle under a bushel? Or are we letting it shine so that the world can see? Because we know that light dissipates darkness and the world is full of darkness. What are we doing to shine our light? Then we see in verses 23 uh, through 25, we see the golden rule explained. So Jesus goes from talking about the light, right? And so we are the light, and we should be reflecting the light. The light should be shining in our community. And then he goes on to talk about the golden rule. He says in verse number 23, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. He's telling them, hey, listen up, don't miss this. And, and, and he's saying that about both parables right here, right? So he's talking about the light parable, and he's also talking about the golden rule parable. In verse number 24 it says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. So he's saying again, listen up. Get ready. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something else. Take heed, heed what you hear. Understand what you hear. With what measure ye meet, it should be measured to you. When we think about that meet, it means it's like a judgment. What, what measure ye judge, or what measure, you know, what standard you're living against is the standard you're going to be judged against. And so we think about the Pharisees. 
the Pharisees took the 613 laws and made it 6,113 laws, didn't they? And so, they, they, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but they made a lot more laws than there were. And so, when, when Jesus said, here's the, the standard that you want other people to live in, is the standard you're going to be judged according to. Right? So, if you want to be treated well, you should treat others well. Right? What does the Golden Rule say? It says, do unto others, or it says, um, do unto others how you, or treat others the way that you want to be treated. Isn't that the golden rule? And so it, it doesn't say treat others the way that you have been treated. Because if that happened, the, the world would be full of mean people, right? But, but it says to treat others the way that you want to be treated. And so Jesus here is saying, hey, I know that you have these standards. I know that you are, you're judging people against these standards. But that same standard that you want other people to live up to, you need to live up to or you need to, or you need to get rid of it. The standard is not the laws. The standard is not the extra rules. No, the standard is Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus Christ, guess what? Jesus Christ shows grace. He shows love. He shows favor, doesn't he? And so if we want to live a life that's living the life of Christ, if we want to live like Jesus, we must show the same grace that he showed to us. Right? The, the world is full of mean people. Christians should be the nicest people out there. Right? When, when people see Christians, they shouldn't go, man, that guy's mean. No, they should go, wow, there's something different about that guy. He's so nice to me. Even when I've been mean to him, he has been so nice to me. We think about Jesus. Jesus was the greatest example of this. Think about as Jesus is hanging on the cross. And we're going to dive deeper into this a little bit in, in a couple weeks. But as Jesus is hanging there on the cross, he's getting beaten. He's getting, he has a crown of thorns on his head. He has nails in his hands, right? And he asks for somebody to drink and they give him vinegar. And so uh, he has just been beaten and tortured and destroyed for, for a whole day. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Think about that. Now, oftentimes we imagine someone stole a parking spot. Or some sort of church pew, right? Maybe not here, but, but a lot of churches, you go and, and you can see people and they're like, man, that guy's, in my, that guy's in my seat. We get mad over that, but Jesus, as he's hanging on the cross, his Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. We should live a life like Jesus. The parable goes on to say that if they're taking care of what God has given them, they will get more. But if we don't take care of what God has given us, it will be taken away from us. And I, I think this can go back to the light a little bit, doesn't it? And God has given us all the light. And, and if we're not going to use the light, He's going to take the light away. We need to be sharing the light of Jesus. And not only that, we should be acting like Jesus. Jesus is the greatest standard. Jesus is the only standard. The point of this parable is to respond to the things that God has given you. If God has given you grace, show grace. If God has given you love, show love. If God has given you favor, show favor. Amen? That, that's what God has called all of us to do. It's the golden rule. And we want to treat others the way that we want to be treated. Then verses 26 through 29, it, the, the, the summary of it would be, You sow, God grows. And how many of us have ever planted a garden? I planted a garden. Didn't go very well, but I planted a garden. And, and how many of us have planted a garden without doing any research before we planted the garden? That's me. So here, here's uh, so I did us all a favor. I went on I went on Google uh, when I was studying for this, and I typed in what are some things that I need to know before starting a garden. Uh, but before beginning to plant a garden, what are three things? Or you know, I, they, they gave me a list of six, and I took three of them because some of them were silly. But here's the three things that I found when I did a quick Google search. Number one, the soil is just as important as the plants that you plant. That's good, right? The soil is just as important. And if you know anything about about plants, if you want to get a good crop of strawberries, the soil needs to be a little sandy, right? And, and the, the, the soil is different from other plants. And so uh, you can't just plant everything in the same soil. You can't just give everything the same amount of water, no. And you can't just plant any plant at any time of the year, right? There's seasons where you plant, and then there's seasons when you harvest. 
And so, uh, before we get started with our garden, we must realize that the soil is just as important as the seed we're planting. Number two is I need a watering and maintenance schedule for the garden. It's pretty good, isn't it? You, before you get started, you should realize that a garden is going to take some work. Right? It's not just something that you, you throw some seed in the ground and then you leave it alone and you come back in a few months and everything's grown. No. If you do that, you're going to come back and you're going to have weeds and you're going to have thorns and you're going to have uh, tomato plants and watermelon plants like this, right? And so if you don't maintain and water your garden, it's, going, it's not going to work. And you say, Brother Cody, what does this have anything to do with the message? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. There's one more thing. The easy plants aren't always the easy ones. So when someone says that that plant, and you should grow this one first, because it's the easiest, it does not mean that it's easy for everyone. Okay, so, Brother Cody, what do those three things have to do with this story? Number one, the soil is just as important as the, the seed. If the soil is not prepared for the Word of God, it's not going to grow. Right? Right? If the soil isn't prepared for the Word of God, if it isn't cultivated, if it isn't uh, weeded, if it, if it isn't prepared for the seed, it's not going to grow. Then what is the, the water and your maintenance schedule for? The Christian life needs watering. It needs, it needs weeding, doesn't it? it? It needs water and it needs maintenance. Our Christian life needs water and maintenance. It does, and we say, oh, that, that makes no sense. No, it, it makes a lot of sense because if we just plant a seed and we never water it, it's not going to grow, it's going to die. You ever been out in the Texas heat and you hadn't had any water? Think about a plant. But think about our Christian life. We are surrounded by darkness all day. We are surrounded by things that, that steal life more than they give life. And then if we never, never reach out and read the Word of God and water the soil, water the seed, it's not going to grow. And if we allow weeds, if we allow distractions to come into our life and to distract us from the Word of God, we will not grow. We'll be, we'll be choked out. We'll be stuck eating, drinking milk for the rest of our life and never getting to the meat of the Word. When we think about this, the easy plants aren't always the easy ones. The Christian life is not easy. Just because someone says it's easy does not mean it's easy. And, and, and it can be easier for other people than it is for, for others, right? It, it's different for everyone. But the thing is, we it's, it takes work, it takes maintenance, it takes water, it takes the right type of soil. So we need to allow ourselves to be here and hear from God. Here we know that the parable is talking about the kingdom of God. It's talking about the kingdom of God. It's talking about the growth of the kingdom. Just as none of us have power to make our gardens grow, right? We can't just go out there and be like abracadabra grow. No, none of us have that. None of us have that power. And just as the sower here, he goes out and, and the seed grows and he doesn't know anything about it, right? He, he's not, a, he's not a, a scientist who goes out and studies the seed. No, he, he knows what needs to happen. He knows how to prepare the soil. He knows how to uh, water the soil. He knows how to maintain the ground. But he does not know how the soil grows. You know who grows the seed? God. It's not about us. We think about our church. Uh, we can do all we can, all we want to muster up church growth. But at the end of the day, if we are the ones that are doing it, it doesn't matter. Because the weeds are going to come in, right? And they're going to choke out people. And they're going, to, they're going to destroy people. No, but if we allow God to do the growing, and we cultivate the soil, and we prepare the way, we preach the gospel every week, we, we go and tell others about Jesus, and, and we live a Christian, live not a Christian life, but the Christian life, God will give the increase. I truly believe that. I believe that if we do what God has asked us to do, and we prepare the soil, God is going to provide the growth. Just because we don't see results right away doesn't mean we quit planting seeds. That's hard for all of us, isn't it? I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm that guy, like, if I go on a diet, and if I go on the scale to, after day one of the diet and I don't see any results, I'm like, man, this thing doesn't work. 
I, I hate this diet. I'm, I'm starving to death. And, and I have not seen one ounce taken off. But the, the, the thing is, in the Christian life, it's the same way. We might go years without seeing someone. We might go months. We might go days. But, but God is going to give the increase. But we can never stop planting the seed. Right? As Christians, we should be thankful when we see the kingdom growing. We think about the original disciples that, that were hearing Jesus with this. There, there was just a few, right? And then uh, by the time John died, then there was thousands, right? Maybe, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of believers that were alive at that time. Think about how many more are alive today. Well, the kingdom didn't grow overnight. It took time. And just as the kingdom doesn't grow overnight, and we know that the church is not the kingdom of God, right? The, the, the kingdom of God is different than the church. The, the kingdom of God is made up of saved people. And so we know that the church is a, a separate assemblies. And so the, just as this applies to the kingdom, I think it can to apply to our church as well. We have to be faithful with the planting. We have to be faithful with the cultivating. We have to be faithful with the weeding. We have to be faithful with the watering. But God is going to be faithful with the growing. That's what God has called all of us to do. As long as, as, long as God gives us breath in our lungs, we should be kingdom-minded. We should. We should be thinking about the kingdom. Notice verse number 28. It says, The earth bringeth forth the fruit of herself. There was nothing the farmer could do except try to make the conditions right for growth. There's a process that happens. Look, the seed was planted. Then comes a blade out of the ground. And then comes the ear. And then the full corn in the ear. And then comes the fruit. And so it's not just something that you plant a seed and the next day it's growing, right? No, that's not how it works. It's, it's a process. And so what is the point of this parable? The point is we must share the good news of Jesus with others. But only God can make it grow in their life. Just as we have no idea what happens under the soil that causes the plant to grow, we don't know how God grows the kingdom, but understand that the conditions that are needed are we need to preach and share the gospel. You say, oh, well, I'm not a preacher. No, we're all preachers. We're all called to preach, to share the gospel, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach and share the gospel, but God does the work inside of that person. Let me think about this mustard seed parable. The mustard seed. It says, and in verse number 30, says, Where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? He's, he's saying, hey, so I, I just explained it pretty good back here with the corn analogy, right? But, but we're going to take it a step further. I'm going to explain it a little bit more. And he says that the kingdom, uh, in verse number 31, is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. How many of you have ever seen a mustard seed? It's a little guy. It's really small. Really small. But how many of you know what that mustard seed turns into? It turns into a tree. Can you believe that? I, I had to look that up to make sure that was real. Tell me, there's no way. But no, it, when the Bible says that that little mustard seed turns into to a bigger uh, plant than all of the other herbs, it's not joking, right? And that wasn't a hyperbole, no. This little seed turns into a huge tree, so big that the, that the birds can rest underneath it, right? They can nest underneath it. We think about that, that seed of corn that you put in the ground. That just grows one stalk. No, but this little mustard seed, just a little tiny thing, grows into this huge tree. What is why, what, what was Jesus saying? He's saying that if we're faithful with the little seeds, He will grow the big seeds. And I'm not preaching prosperity today, right? I'm preaching the Bible. The Bible says that. I'm not making that up. I'm not saying if you send me a check for $100,000 that the church is going to grow. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Because that's not true. And anyone who says that is a liar. But what I'm saying is if we are faithful, and we continue to be faithful and continue to be faithful and continue to be faithful. We might not see anything for a while, but God is going to grow what He says He's going to grow. The disciples here, the, the apostles, think about them. They, they, they saw that the kingdom started small. And then He saw what it grew into. What is the point of all this? Be faithful with the little things. Be faithful with what God has given you. Even if God is putting you in, in, in Stephenville, Texas, God has put you here for a reason. 
Hey, if God has put you in Washington Street Baptist Church, you're here for a reason. Amen? And we should be faithful until God calls us home. As long as we have breath in our lungs, we need to be doing what God has called us to do. We think about verses 33 and 34. It says, And with such parables spake he the word unto them that they were able to hear. So Jesus was aware of his audience, wasn't he? He's, he's, he only spoke as many parables as they could understand. And so Brother Stewart here was here a few weeks ago. I think about when I had him in, in seminary. That guy is a genius. And I, I don't know if you've died, if you've ever heard him preach, but he can preach. He can take like like one little verse and preach a whole series on about about Noah or, or something like that. He, he's just he's a genius, and we would leave class with our heads spinning. Like, what did he just say? I got like, I got half of it, but I'm going to have to chew on the rest. I started having to record classes so I could really dive back into what he said. But Jesus was here, and Jesus saw his audience, and he, and he listened and saw and read his audience, and, and he only went as far as they could handle. But there's just as, uh, just as it says over in Corinthians, I believe, where it talks about that we start on, on milk, and then we work ourselves up to meat, and then strong meat. Jesus knew that these people were only ready for the milk. And, and when, he, when he took his disciples away, he gave them some meat, didn't he? And so we must be the same. Jesus was aware of the capacity of the hearer. When Jesus spoke publicly, he spoke on the level of, the, of his audience. But when he got his disciples alone, he expounded on the things that he taught in public. In conclusion this morning, we think about this. Jesus spoke in parables. To his audience to teach a heavenly truth with an earthly story. He reminded us that the church is the candlestick that holds up the light, which is Jesus. And we should hold up the light so that others can see. He also reminded us that we plant the seed and he grows the seed. But what we should do is remain faithful and make sure the conditions are right for growth. And God will provide the increase. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for these parables. God, we thank you that while these parables are some 2,000 years old, God, they're still relevant to us today, and we can still learn truth from them. God, we thank you for your word. God, be with us as we enter into the next hour, God, the preaching hour. God, just be with uh, those who are on their way, God, and those who haven't made it here yet. God, we just want to see your will be done. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.